Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined today by Mr. John Keane, uh, retired Master Sergeant John Keane. Correct. Uh, who is currently the machine gun, the NFA expert for the Morphe Auction Company, and before that was the NFA expert for the James Julia Auction House. And I think he has forgotten more about military historical machine guns than I have yet learned. So. John here is my go, one of my go-to guys for machine gun questions, and there's a question that I just kind of get, not, not every day, but pretty repeatedly, and that is some form of, I have this machine gun that I found, I don't know if it's registered, and I don't want the police to arrest me and burn down my house, what do I do? Right. And I'm sure you get that question too. I do. I get it fairly frequently. Uh, Occasionally, someone contacts me, especially my position in the auction house and having right. expertise in this area, saying, hey, I've got this. I've seen your machine guns advertised on the auction site, or I've seen where you've got a whole lot of money for this one. Can you do the same thing for me? And, uh, and one of the first questions I ask is, is it registered? And sometimes I get a, I don't know. And, uh, is it and, what now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, or I don't think so, or how can I tell? So this often happens when uh, a World War II veteran, or maybe a Korean, or a, well, yeah, a Korean or a Vietnam War veteran passes away, and they brought a gun back, and it's up in the attic, and this this is kind of the stereotypical right. example, like grandpa or great grandpa now brought back an MP40. Now we the you know his wife and children and grandchildren find it cleaning out the house. We don't know if it's registered. We can't ask him. He has died. Yes. If we don't find, if you find that paperwork right. from BATF or tr Department, Department of the Treasury, Treasury or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, one of those two things, it's an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper, and it'll say Department of Treasury on the top of it, or Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. If it's a much later form, and you'll see the gun, you'll see a serial number on there. Save it. Yeah, very important. If you have that paper, you don't need this video. You can move on to step two, which is dealing with the transfer. Right. What we're curious about, though, is how do you find out? Like, let's say he did register it, but that paper disappeared 50 years ago. Right. What or it was I... destroyed in a fire. Yeah. That happens. Or, or I don't know if he did register it right. or not. Or he always said it was. I've had that happen. Yeah. They always said it was, but I can't find any documents. Or he was so clever. He put those documents in a safe place, but I don't know where they are. Right. They're under some floorboard in the house he sold 40 years ago. That happens. So. That happens. Let's say my grandfather has died. I've, my grandmother and I find this MP40. What can we do? Okay. One of the things you want to do is you want to identify what it is. You already say it's a German MP40. Have somebody who's savvy with the internet get on there, Google, contact Ian. He knows. I answer or, these questions. Or he'll, or he'll contact basis. me and I'll help. Um, and. Uh, and, uh, and we'll determine what the model is. Take some pictures. Take pictures, pictures are essential. Digital pictures. pictures of the gun as a whole, digital pictures of the markings on the yeah. gun. You're gonna need that, yeah. all right? No matter what happens, you're gonna need that. Um, so uh, once you have that, then you can contact the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and say, I have found this gun. Now, here's something I want to lay your fears, okay? If the gun is registered and the person who's deceased was the registered owner, somebody, the heir, becomes the person who is allowed under law to have constructive possession of that machine gun until such time as the orderly transfer occurs from the decedent to a lawful heir or to whomever that lawful heir designates. So if in the case, let's say your grandfather passed away, Ian, and <laughs> Granny is alive and lucid, and she is named in his will as the heir or the personal representative or the executrix, and the probate has occurred and it's illegal in your state that she's the person who has authority to act on behalf of the deceased, then Granny can have possession of that gun. She should take it and secure it and lock it up in a safe place so that the, the grandchildren can't just go out and have a fun time shooting with it because it's not okay for the grandchildren to have constructive position, possession of it just for Granny until the transfer occurs. Okay. So, if you don't know if it's registered, secure it in a safe place after you take some good pictures of it. Then you can contact the BATF and say, my name is Granny such and such. My husband such and such. 
of this city and this state has passed away. And there was a machine gun, what I suspect is a machine gun. And I want to find out if it's registered. I have not been able to find any paperwork. But I think he brought it back, or maybe his father brought it back, or maybe uncle brought it back from World War II. I'm not sure, but I want to find out. What the BATF is going to do is they're going to want to know the city and state that the deceased may be owner lived in, the full name of the person who it might have been registered to, and their date of birth, if you've got it, not critical, but helps. Okay. Um, and they're going to ask for detailed digital photographs of the gun and its markings, an overall picture of the gun and a picture of the markings on the gun. Uh, the MP40 and most of the German guns, they're, they're very difficult. It's not just straightforward. There's a serial number, it's one, two, three, four. Then we look and see if there's one, two, three, four in the registry. Voila, there it is. One gun, one registry that happens to be grandpa, you're golden. And it's not that straightforward because the Germans, for example, maybe they made 300,000 of this model of machine gun. And they, the way they numbered them was one through nine, 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 nine. And then it went one A through nine, 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 A, and then through the B and C, and they've even got to the double, double letter suffixes. And, and when they restarted that and every they, year. And then some, so. in some models they restarted it every year by factory. The Steyer factory might've had, a, has a different serial number, a same serial number, as the Mauser factory, who made the same model of gun. And there's a lot of variability in how these guns were originally registered. So right. if there's a letter at the beginning or the end of a serial number, it may or may not actually be on the registration. Right. When grandpa or uncle, great uncle, registered it, he might have just looked at the back cap of the gun and said, oh, that's 638. And they didn't see that the actual receiver number should be 1638T. Right. And so there's a variation. So that's why they ask for all the markings. They ask for the name. Um, and also okay. remember that if you have multiple guns, all have a four-digit serial number, but they were made by different manufacturers different years, you might have six different MP40s in the National Firearms Act registry with the same serial number in the registry. And the only difference being the registered person's name, right. date of birth, state, at, and, and, and city at the time they would have registered it. But the BNTF, let me assure you, is not out to get you. Okay. I think that's a big question on a lot of people's minds is, I look at, I, here's this machine gun, and I happen to know, I looked it up, an illegal, possession of an illegal machine gun is $250,000 fine and 10 years in jail. Could be. And I really want to keep grandpa's, you know, grandpa got this gun legitimately from the Germans. He, he and it, it fair and square in combat. And it should stay <laughs> in our family, but I don't want to go to jail. Right. So I think a lot of people are concerned about can we trust or can they trust the BATF to act in good faith if they are, if I contact them and say, I am currently committing a criminal act with this machine gun. And Please they're going to say, no, you're not creating a criminal act. Let me, let me give you a real world anecdote. Okay. Um, a Vietnam War veteran brought back what he considered to be an AK-47. And he dutifully at the time went through the Department of State got the necessary documents to bring it back, uh, went through the, uh, the Vietnamese government and got an export permit from them wow. in Vietnamese Jeez. and translated in English. And he brought the gun back, all right? And there he has all this documentation said it's okay for him to have it. Uh, but he never registered it okay. during the amnesty of 1968. And he sees, wow, look at how much money those things bring now. And he contacted me and said, what can we do? And I talked him through this process. And, and I assured him, no, they're not gonna come in here and snap the cuffs on you and say, now we got you. You're doing your due diligence. What the BATF most wants, they want the orderly transfer of the National Firearms Act items that are in the registry to the next person in the line of succession or to somebody who's bought it. They don't like it with many thousands of machine guns or certainly a significant number of machine guns registered to people born before 1900. And there are a lot of guns out there registered to people in the registry. And as far as the BATF's concerned, they're registered to people born before 1900. So what? That's whom they're legally registered to. Right. Even though those people can't conceivably be alive today. Yeah. So that's the way. All right. So we were saying you want to send them, uh, I presume easiest way to do is contact them by email. 
You can contact them by pictures. email or you can make a phone call to them. Okay. Um, and then they will give you an email address to send them to. And because of these questions of how things are in the registry, it, it's important to include who you think probably registered the gun. That's what they're going to do. And the, like, way, the way their system works is they can put in a serial number and they'll get a screen however long it is with that number in it. Or it might come up not found. All right. Uh, and just because it comes up not found doesn't mean it's not registered. As I said, maybe the suffix, maybe it's in there with the letter suffix, maybe it's in there without the letter suffix, maybe it's a different number on the gun. I've seen guns where there is a misspelling. That's like, right. I saw one show shot. The serial number is CSRG, which is the abbreviation of the gun, but someone actually wrote the wrong thing. They wrote CSRB. Right. And it's in the registry of CSRB. But if you look it up as CSRG in the number, it's going to... That's not correct. Sure but so. if that gun were to surface in your great grandson's possession, and you law and you misplace, or they don't have the registration form, and they go to read the thing, and they put C S R G, and they put in the column Ian, they're going to see no, no. Right. But if they take pictures of it, um, and they and they say, oh look, looks like let's check a couple variances. Right. Or let's see what McCollum has registered, and right. maybe there's something very similar. So, right. and this could be—it's not necessarily the two of the same name. If you had two uncles uh, on different sides of the family who were both in the war, may, you know, and they either one could have transferred it to your father. Right. Give them, you know, yeah. both names and where they were. What I want to accentuate born. here is the ATF. What they did in this case of this one Vietnam yeah. War veteran is we sent. Me helping him. Wrote, Ghost wrote the appropriate letter. He signed it. He, he sent it in. Um, they, the ATF contacted him and said, we would like to send somebody to guide, come by your place and examine the gun. Uh, and he said, that's fine. And agent came in, uh, very professional, very courteous, and said, okay, I'm here. He identified himself. Uh, the person, he asked the person to produce the firearm, which he did. Here it is. And the guy looked at it, and he immediately realized, upon examination, that it wasn't actually an AK-47 machine gun. After all, it was an SKS. <laughs> um, Oops. And uh, and he said, "No problem. Well, that's that's nothing, nothing. Not nothing. National Firearms Act here. Um, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your diligence, and see you later." That was one scenario. Let me give you one that's more accurate to what would, what might happen. Uh, had another situation where a woman's father had passed away. There were three machine guns involved. Uh, she followed through with her mother, who was granny, as it were, and had the and had authority to act. Sent the letter in. The ATF contacted her. Unfortunately, in this case, granny passed away between the time that she wrote the letter and the BATF came along and contacted granny. Was not in great health. Uh, BATF came. Show me the guns, please. Yes, thank you very much. This gun was registered to somebody, not your father. This gun was registered to somebody, not your father. This gun is not in the registry at all. Um, we are now going to take possession of these three guns. Please sign this receipt saying you've released possession of these guns to us, and we will be on our way. And the woman signed off on them, and the guns went away out the door. Okay, so regard, once you send them this email and information and a request for help, you will get an ATF agent wanting to make an appointment you with you regardless will, You of, have started a chain of events that you will need to see through to conclusion. Because once you've sent them the letter and the photographs, the BATF know you have something. And they, are, they may take six to eight weeks before they actually contact you or get in touch with you. But they dare not leave it alone, right? Because they have to do their due diligence, right? right? They uh, they don't do not want to read in the news somewhere that some act of mayhem has occurred with this thing uh, at some point and, and realize that of. ooh, why didn't we follow up on that? Sure, you know. So they're no. they're they're going to do their job, and the BATF is not what it once was. They are really looking to. Make the, the the most important thing right now they want to do is make the registry accurate. Okay. And they want to make sure that the guns are registered to people who are eligible and alive. Okay. So they appreciate your due diligence 
in helping them can do this. Okay, so if the, let's say the gun is registered, Grandpa just lost the paperwork. Yep, or it's misplaced. Right, but it is there, and they find it. Yep. What happens? What's the then outcome there? One of the things you do when you write that letter to them, you're requesting a copy of the registration form if it if they have it. And if they have it and they find it based on the pictures and the serial number you give them, or variations of the serial number you give them, again, it's nice to get somebody with expertise uh, mm -hmm. who can help you with that letter writing. Uh, they'll say, oh, and they'll mail you a copy of the registration form. Oh, that's and that's cool. And there you go. And then you just take and you do what we can cover in some other video. Okay. And that's just a how to deal with that. Um, uh, and if, and if they, well, they come to your house and they look at it and say, you know, we didn't think this was registered, but now upon examination, we see this serial number and we have see, there's a variable here and it looks like your great uncle, in fact, did register this gun. So now what you need to do is find out who the designated heir is to your great uncle. And once you find that, then you can fill out this paperwork. You can even have it transferred to a lawful heir, or you can designate it to be transferred to an auction company to sell, you, sell it for you and get you a bunch of money. Or you can transfer it to your family friend, Ian McCollum, the Forgotten Weapons here, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he can, and that's a tax paid $200 transfer when you transfer it to somebody other than a lawful heir. Okay. But if it's going to a lawful heir, zero cost. So here's one variation of this that that I just realized there is. What if, like you said, they find out who it's registered to, but it's not the person who just died. Like it was your uncle, maybe in your family, or maybe it's someone else. Do they take the gun with them then until you can prove like who was my uncle Bob? An interesting variable and it has happened and I can tell you exactly what happens. The BATF cannot discuss the information about a registered firearm to anybody other than the person who that firearm is registered to or to the person who is that person's either authorized person. In other words, if, if I write a letter and I send it to the BATF sign saying, you may discuss machine guns that I own or register to me with Ian McCollum. And Ian McCollum can identify himself to the BATF and they'll talk to him about it and tell him all this information yeah. and that information. Um, or if there's no such letter, then it's the lawful heir. Okay. So if Uncle Joe is the registered owner and they come and they say, this gun is registered, but it's not registered to Granny and it's not registered to anybody here. Therefore, I cannot discuss who that gun is registered to, but I'm going to take possession of that gun now and I'm going to take it and I'm going to return it to its lawfully registered owner. Now, if you have identified Uncle Joe as potentially being one of the registered owner, uh, they may say, do you have a, the person who's the, uh, the heir to Uncle Joe present, or do you know who might be the heir to Uncle Joe? And in that, in that interview, when they're there in front of you, uh, you say, well, yes, it's Cousin Vinny. Uh, and he lives over, he lives over in Wisconsin. Um, I said, why don't you have Cousin Vinny contact us about this matter? Okay. They'll, be, they'll be that way. They won't tell you that it's registered to Uncle Joe. They won't tell you that Vinny is the guy, but they might lead you to say, it might be a good idea if Cousin exactly. Vinny, whoever the heir to Uncle Joe is, have them get in touch with us. I think that'd be a good idea. Okay. Because they they could lose their jobs if they divulge right. this information. It's They can't, by law, okay. do it. All right. And of course, worst case is, it's completely unregistered. In which case they will depart with that weapon in hand, you sign a release, they depart weapon in hand, that weapon eventually goes, it goes with them to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, it will sit in a place for a period of time, they will, somebody with knowledge will examine it to see if it is anything rare and unusual that they don't already have a specimen of in their, in their vast collection of variable specimens. And if it doesn't have anything particularly remarkable about it, it will be cut into pieces and melted down okay. and destroyed. So let's say I find the gun, and let's say it's a, an 0815 Maxim. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know that there's a lot of bits in a Maxim that are worth some money that sure. aren't a firearm legally. Right. Can I, like, when they show up, can I present them with just a receiver? Absolutely. Or if, like, if I just show them, here's the whole gun, 
you know, Don't let's take, look at all the numbers and see if we can register get it, find it yeah. regi in the register. You show them the whole gun, they see the whole gun there. It is very likely that if it's not registered, they're going to take the whole gun with them. That's they won't let me strip some they parts off They first. will not let you strip things off in their presence, um, to my knowledge. Okay. As variable as any doctor or law enforcement officer is, the person sitting in front of you from the BATF may say, you know what? Just this receiver piece is the registered part. As long as I have that piece, I don't care about the rest. You can take those parts off in front of them. They're willing to let you do it. And then the gun can go out the door. If it were me, or if it was my brother, let's say, I would say, hey, brother, take all these parts off. And when they show up, just show them the bare receiver piece. If it's registered, you can always put those pieces back on. If it's not registered, you've got possession of the parts, and you can sell the parts for a bunch of money. Okay. And they're not legally there's nothing, restricted. There's right? nothing illegal or restricted okay. in the United States about the parts. It depended upon local state laws. Some states don't allow magazines of a certain gotcha. capacity. True. Some people don't like. Some states don't like assault rifles, and you know that's state and local law stuff. I think it's it's important to highlight here that I. It, I'm getting the feeling a lot of this is based on uh, you're presenting a, ca a legitimate case. You're, you're proving your legitimacy of, yes. look, I found this thing in the attic and, and here's what it is. And I want to resolve this in a legal manner. Right. And if you don't want to be the sort of guy who's going to try and strip all the parts off, but then play it stupid and pretend like you don't know anything about how machine guns work, uh, like you're talking to a real human. Right. They have perception. They can, they're, they're not idiots. Right. They're not. If you strip the parts off, that's fine, but don't pretend like it maybe was accidental or, you know, All you're right. asking for their trust, give them yours. Right. That's it. They, by, by far and large, the encounters that people I have known have had with the BATF in situations, if you are honest, if you're straightforward and you're doing your due diligence, and that's the thing, if someone starts to get, get blustery when you say, hey, I'm just doing my due diligence. I found this thing. I contacted you to try to resolve it. I'm not in any way a bad guy here. I'm just doing what any good law-abiding straightforward citizen would do right. in the circumstances. They're not, going, they're, not, they're not out there to tie you up in knots or to give you a hard time. They have far more important criminals and things like that to go chase after. Um, on the other hand, if they smell a rat somehow, it's not going to go good for you. So don't try to pull a fast one. Um, I have, you know, the patriarch of the machine gun hobby in this country this wrote me a letter one time. Oh, well, I tried to make a correction to the registry on this uh, this uh, this Maxim gun, and I think, and he wrote it. I think they were they thought I was trying to pull a fast one. And they weren't going to buy it, and they were going to do it. So I just kind of dropped the whole thing. Could have been a nice thing for them. Well, of course, that was 25 years ago. The BATF is not the same as it was 25 years ago. It's got a significant number of people who really are friendly to the gun hobby, and they want to do the, as I said, I think before, their most important thing is to convey the orderly transfer of the National Firearm Act guns from person to person in accordance with law. And they want to get the registry more accurate than it has been previously. And there is something else I wanted to mention. Okay. That the registry is not 100% accurate. Yeah. There are guns that were registered in 1934, registered between 1934 and 68, registered in 1968, and registered up until the, the last time they could have been in 1986, that don't show in the registry today because back in the days when it was just paper and then it was, it was little, little index cards like on a Rolodex, sometimes those things got misplaced or missing when they moved from office to office. And before they put them into the information retrieval system that is now there, um, they're not going to find it in the registry. That's why that form is so important yeah. to safeguard. Because uh, there will be an occasion, it, it does happen where someone has the form and they submit a transfer. And like ATF comes back and says, oh, you can't transfer that. It's not registered. That's correct. And then it's your, you, the thing that makes that gun legal is the only copy that exists is in your possession. And, that, and they will honor it. Yeah. I had a very, I had a very good cl close friend, 
one of my mentors. He passed away, uh, and his son contacted me to help him with the quarterly transfer of the, of the guns. This friend of mine had registered over 100 NFA guns during the amnesty of 1968. <laughs> and when the, there was not 100 to transfer after he passed away, but there was a significant number, and the, the ATF came in and said, this gun is not founded. It's not in the registry. This gun is not founded. It's not in the registry. Well, my friend had the original amnesty registration forms in his possession. He even had a copy of the receipt where the BATF had signed for it in 1968 when he submitted it. And his son had these originals. And uh, he took the he took copies. He sent them to the BATF. The BATF was like, wow. Well, um, and they came back and... Uh, and they said, well, thank you very much. And they did the transfer. They corrected the registry based on those original. He sent the copies the first time. They came back and said, we must have the originals. And then they... Boy, did, that's, they that's a that. leap of faith right there. And, then, and this, this, this son of this friend of mine said, I don't know if I want to send those originals. What if I send the originals? And they lose them. And they don't have them. And I said, then you just document them with your... Certified mail. <laughs> Certified mail, and you have a, your, your friend, the attorney, witness you putting them in there and sign an affidavit that they saw, you saw these originals of this copy, which you, you certify true copies with an attorney, you keep the certified true copies, you send the originals to them, you will have the attorney watch you put them in there in a certified return receipt mail, and if the BATF says they lost them at some point, you can bring out your certified copies, you can bring out the attorney as a witness, and you can say, there it is. Yeah. It didn't have to come to that. They dutifully and appropriately did what they had to do and transferred the guns to the lawful heir of this. And the, the guns are still in his possession. All right. Well, excellent. Hopefully, this has uh, been informative for some people. Uh, hopefully, this will answer questions for people who find themselves in this potentially really sticky and scary situation. Right. So, And if you find something like that, if you have some variable... Um, contact Ian, contact me, um, and I'll be happy to help you through uh, the pitfalls. But the right. most thing to remember is, if you do your due diligence, if you're acting in good faith, the ATF is not going to just walk in there and snap the cuffs on you and drag you off and burn your house down. They're that's not always, interested in doing that. That's good to know. Yeah. All right. Um, how do people find you? Where can people um, get in touch with you? You can get in touch with me. You can go to uh, just Google up Morphe Auctions. Dot com, and you'll see our website. We hold auctions several times a year with some great machine guns and other guns in it. And if you contact the auction company and say, hey, I want to talk to John Keen, uh, they will put you in touch with me. All right. And your email address is on the website, too. Yes, it is. So. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Tune in tomorrow for a cool forgotten weapon.